started. Welcome everyone. This is our second uh, Implementation Science Initiative seminar uh, through the CTSA and New York State Psychiatric Institute for this academic year. Um, and we are very, very excited um, and honored to have Dr. Kate Quastafaro, who um, has recently moved to New York City and is an assistant professor at NYU. So we are thrilled to have her locally. So I'm going to introduce you to Kate. Um, so she is an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences and associate director of the Center for the Advancement and Dissemination of Intervention Optimization at NYU. Uh, her focus and studies have been in prevention science, uh, and she did a postdoctoral fellowship in the prevention and methodology training program at Penn State. And she's focused a lot on innovative methods for optimization, uh, evaluation, and most the, the uh, multi-phase optimization strategy, which she will be talking about today. Um, I'm really, really, really happy to have her here because I think she is really thinking about the innovative intersection of working much earlier with intervention optimization um, and how we need to be thinking about this early uh, as we are planning for implementation. So she's going to be talking about that intersection today, um, and I'm really thrilled to welcome her. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I'm delighted to join you today. Um, and my my Twitter handle is on the screen. And for now, please follow me and you know interact with me on Twitter. I love that. Um, the title of my talk today is "When the Powers of Intervention Optimization and Implementation Science Combine." Um, that was funnier in my head as I wrote it. I hope you understand. Um, okay. So a brief roadmap of where we're going. I'm going to share with you the rationale for intervention optimization, give you an extremely brief overview of most, um, walk through a hypothetical example of how most may be used to identify an optimized intervention. And then I'm really hoping to leave quite a bit of time for discussion and questions. So, when we think about the way in which the majority of interventions have been developed, they fall into this category that we call the classic treatment package approach. And what happens is we read through the literature, we read through theory, we read through clinical practice, and we identify any number of components that we think are important to affecting the outcome of interest. We take those components, we package them together as an intervention, we shove them into this, you know, proverbial black box, and then test that intervention via a randomized control trial. Now, like I said, any number of interventions have been developed this way over time. There's nothing wrong with this approach. There's nothing wrong with the RCT. However, the RCT, the design, cannot help us identify the contribution of each of those components on the outcome of interest. We also are not able to decide whether or not the inclusion of one of those components has a positive or negative impact on another component. So what, how they're kind of interacting. We have no idea if a component's contribution towards the outcome offsets its cost. So think, for example, like motivational interviewing. It takes a lot to train up people. It takes a lot of time to deliver it. Is it worth it? We were not able to determine that in the RCT. We have no idea, no sense, if we really need all of those components that we identified. And the next steps on how to make the intervention more effective or more efficient or more scalable, that's not really abundantly clear in this approach. Further, I'm not anti-RCT, but I'm just pointing out some, some problems. <laughs> the RCT is incredibly resource intensive and produces limited information. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of person hours to execute a properly done RCT. And then by definition, right, the randomized control trial is conducted in a highly controlled environment. It's not the real world. And for that reason, more often than not, the interventions that are developed in this approach are not readily scalable or implementable. And then, you know, this happens to all of us. The RCT might not produce a positive effect. 
or your results might not be replicable. And so then what? What do you do? So again, not anti-RCT. I'm just showcasing to you that there are some unanswered questions and opportunities with this design. Now, let's, let's step back and think about what happens when we take an intervention and implement it into the real world. Um, oftentimes, we almost immediately need to make a trade-off between effectiveness and implementability. Every component that we've added um, increases the complexity to implement the program, and it consumes a high amount of resources to do so. So for that reason, a, a lot of times when disseminated and implemented in the real world, um, there's a lot of post hoc adaptations to the program or providers are like, Meh, I don't really like this one, so I'm not going to do that component, right? There's a lot of tweaking that kind of goes against the evidence base that we have established. So this is a problem. And I would like to submit to you three, three what if questions. So what if we routinely assessed the effectiveness of individual intervention components? What if we used that empirical information to manage the trade-off between effectiveness and those implementation constraints? And what if the design of the intervention from the beginning could be responsive to local constraints? So those are my what ifs and my, you know, leads to my belief that it's time for a new approach to intervention development and optimization. Now, now I'm going to transition into this very brief introduction of most, and I just need you to know there's no possible way I could teach you everything about most in an hour. <laughs> um, and so I want to just show you a couple of resources. So as Rachel mentioned, we have a new center at NYU, CADIO, the Center for Advancement and Dissemination of Intervention Optimization. That's like the home of most. Um, but we have a sister center, the D3 Center at the University of Michigan, um, and they are handling adaptive intervention designs and experimental designs. So I'll show you that in a second. Um, we recently developed a Coursera course. So that's, uh, you know, self-paced, free um, overview of most. At the end of that training, you would be able to write a grant proposal using most. Um, and the companion or kind of like the textbook that goes along with that is um, the 2018 book written by Linda Collins. So these are all of the resources available right now to fill in some of the blanks that you're going to have after this presentation. Okay, so here we go. Brief introduction. Most, the multi-phase optimization strategy is an engineering-inspired framework for optimizing multi-component behavioral, biobehavioral, biomedical, and social structural interventions. I'm going to just say behavioral moving forward because that is a significant mouthful. Um, what I want to emphasize first in this definition is that most is a framework. Most is not a method. You cannot do a most. And it, it's this framework of thinking. Um, Next thing I'm gonna point out in this definition, what I mean by multi-component. When I say a component, I'm meaning any aspect of an intervention that can be separated out for study. The first thing that likely comes to mind for you is the parts of intervention content, right? So motivational interviewing or uh, home safety is a lot of what I do. Maybe it's uh, counseling. There could be any type of content-related components. But it could also be a feature that could promote engagement or adherence to an intervention. So maybe it's like a, a text message prompt in between sessions. Hey, did you practice doing this today? Or did you remember to take your pill? So that's a feature that could promote engagement or adherence in an intervention. And then lastly, a component could be a feature that's in, aimed at improving the fidelity um, of delivering the intervention. So optimization is not synonymous with optimal. When I say the word optimization, I'm talking about a process through which you identify an intervention 
that provides the best expected outcome that we can possibly get given constraints that are imposed by the need of, for affordability, scalability, and efficiency. So a constraint is anything that might impact the implementation of an intervention. The one that we think of most often and the one that I will use throughout this is money, right? The cost to deliver an intervention per person. But it could also be time, so provider time to deliver it or participant time to participate. When we design a multi-component intervention, there are four things we are after. We call them the four desiderata. First, of course, right? We want an intervention that's effective. We want to do more good than harm. Yes. Now, we also want an intervention that's affordable, which means it could be delivered within available or reasonably obtainable um, constraints resources um, and doesn't exceed what's available. The next thing we want is an intervention that's scalable. So scalable and implementable, kind of using the same words interchangeably here. This means we're after an intervention that could be implemented with fidelity right away. So we don't have to do those ad hoc modifications. And then lastly, we're after an intervention that's efficient which means we're not wasting resources, time, money, et cetera, to get to the outcome of interest. So we want all four of these things, but we're gonna have to balance them. And so another way of thinking about optimization is um, a process of achieving intervention ease, which means you're strategically balancing effectiveness against affordability, scalability, and efficiency. So oh, this will become a little bit more clear in a few moments. Let me just back up to say that if, say, you were writing a grant proposal and you were proposing to use most and you were trying to describe optimization, like this is exactly what you should write. And that's fine. <laughs> All right. So now let's just go back and show the difference of what happens when you develop an intervention using most. Still, you will go through the literature, go through theory, and identify any number of components that you think are important. But before we package them together, we're going to conduct um, empirically based optimization. So I see now this triangle on the screen. Through that process, I'm going to understand the relationship of each component to my outcome and their relationship to each other. So I'm answering some of those unanswered questions I went through at the beginning. Then that information from the optimization process, I use to identify the optimized intervention. So that black box is now see-through because I understand the way in which each one of those components affects the outcome and the way that they affect each other. I have a much better sense of what's actually happening in this intervention process. Then I would test my optimized intervention against a suitable control in the RCT. So the RCT doesn't go away. I just have way more information going into it. All right. So here is a schematic of most. I'm going to go through the three phases um, in kind of high level detail. Um, so the first, well, three phases, preparation, optimization, and evaluation. And you'll quickly see that preparation and evaluation are very similar to, or have activities that are very similar to what you would expect from the classical treatment package approach. It's really the optimization phase that sets most apart. Um, so let's start with the preparation phase. The purpose of this, you're laying the groundwork. This is really fundamental work. A couple of activities that we're going to do um, is developing a conceptual model. And through that development, we will identify a set of candidate components. I'm calling them now candidate components because if you are ascribing to the most framework, you are willing to let go of some of those components. Um, then we would conduct any type of pilot work, right? We're all familiar with that. This is a not powered kind of study, the goal of which is to ascertain acceptability or feasibility. Could also be to work out a protocol. 
And then the last thing that happens in the preparation phase is the identification of an optimization objective. So I'm going to return to that in just one second. The first thing I want to point out or talk about is the conceptual model. Now, oftentimes folks come and they're like, oh, I have a logic model. This will work. And more often than not, the logic model does not provide the level of information we need for optimization. So this version of a conceptual model identifies the very specific intervention components and what those components are targeting. Okay. So instead of like, you know, a logic model, if you'll visualize with me, it's like all of the inputs listed and then all of the outputs. Well, this is going to clearly associate the input with the output. All right. So the conceptual model has broadly three parts of it. Follow me from left to right. Um, we've got intervention components and the way that those target a mediator or causal factor. And then the relationship between those causal factors and the outcome of interest. And this is a really simple starting point. Um, the conceptual model is theoretically and empirically informed, so it becomes far more complicated real easily. Um, but for now, this is this is enough. The um, right side of the model that I have in the circle with my stars, this is the causal process that you are intervening upon. So this is where you are depicting your hypothesis in the relationship between mediators and the outcome. So not a not a logic model, not a structural equation model, not a DAG. This is this is a little bit different. All right, and then the other part of the preparation phase that will be unique um, to to most of you, um, this is heavily drawn from the engineering space. The optimization objective essentially describes the goal that you are trying to achieve in this process. It, it shows and, and labels the way in which you will balance effectiveness against affordability, scalability, and efficiency. So for example, here's three. The first one that you know, is a really good starting point is what we call the all active components optimization objective. And it, according to this one, we would only include the components that produce a positive effect on the outcome, right? So we're basically trimming anything that doesn't produce a significant effect. I started by saying this is a really good place to start. We, we don't do that right now in our current intervention development process. And so if you start there, you're still contributing to science. Um, the second uh, example here is let's say you have done some interviews with providers and you know that you only have 45 minutes with that provider in front of a participant. So your goal, the optimization objective here is to identify the most effective intervention that can be implemented in 45 minutes or less. Right. If you design the Cadillac of all interventions, but it takes three hours to implement, nobody can do it. So instead, we're trying to identify the most effective that can be implemented within that constraint. All right. Not to belabor the point, but cost can also come into this. Let's say you know from insurers that they can only afford $500 per person for this given treatment. So here we're after the intervention that produces the best expected outcome obtained for up to $500 per person. So you see here, this is where kind of the balance of the constraints and implementation comes in with the design and identification of the intervention. All right. So we've done the preparation work. And now we're moving into the optimization phase. And like I said, this is the part that makes most distinct from the RCT or other, um, the classic treatment package approach. It is in this phase that we are building and identifying the optimized intervention. We do this through the optimization trial. And this is a fully powered, rigorous, randomized experimental trial. 
Um, there is often some misconceptions about most that an optimization trial is a pilot. That's not true. This is a fully powered, rigorous experiment. The, so there's any number of experimental designs that you could choose for this trial. The kind of you know decision making that we do in, in identifying the experimental design takes into account one, what your research question is, right? That's always the question a statistician, biostatistician will ask you. <laughs> um, but it also is going to balance the type of intervention you are developing and um, the, the, then with the experimental design. So for example, if you are developing a fixed intervention in which everybody basically gets the same level of intervention, then the factorial or fractional factorial is the most the best match to experimental design for your optimization trial. So the darker the bar, the better the match of the design with the type of intervention. So let's say now that you are developing an adaptive intervention. An adaptive intervention is one in which an individual's performance at a priori specified times then dictates the level of intervention that they receive. So it's adaptive. Um, if you were developing an adaptive intervention, the best match experimental design could be the SMART, the Sequential Multiple Assignment Randomized Trial. It might be a micro-randomized trial or a system identification experiment, depending on how quickly you are adapting. Um, I will not go into detail about adaptive interventions on the SMART. The best place to go for more information about that is the D3 Center at the University of Michigan. The center is directed by Danny Almaral and Billy Naum Shani. Um, they are you know, the leaders when it comes to adaptive interventions and experimental designs. So if you're interested in that, there you go. Let's return to the fixed intervention and factorial experiment. So the factorial experiment is appropriate when you don't know what components are driving the effect. We don't know what components could be removed or modified without sacrificing the effect. We, a uh, factorial experiment is really appropriate when you have those implementation constraints um, that you're trying to balance with effectiveness. And then it, this is where the fixed intervention comes in. This is appropriate when you are trying to identify a treatment package that's suitable for the average or the greatest number of people, okay? So if you are like me, your graduate training perhaps perhaps included the two by two factorial, but it can get way cooler real quick. So the factorial experiment can handle as many factors as you want. Um, we speak about two to the K factorial experiments, which specifies that each factor has two levels. So I'm only going to talk about that. If you'd like to talk more about when there's more levels, we can do that later. Um, let me acknowledge that now my language has shifted to factor rather than component. So when I talk about intervention development, I'm talking about components. When I talk about the experiment of identifying your intervention, I'm talking about factors. They're the same thing, just, you know, we like to use different words to describe the same thing. Um, so the factorial experiment makes it possible to estimate the effect of each factor. That's what we would call the main effect. So that's the independent contribution on the outcome of interest. And then the relationship or the interaction between those components. So the figure, the table here, um, we call this the experimental condition table, reflects a two to the fourth factorial experiment. I have four factors, A, B, C, and D, each of which has two levels. Um, I'm saying yes or no to indicate whether it's on or off, a person gets it or they don't, but these levels can be anything that makes sense to you. So is it high dose versus low dose? Is it standard of care versus enhanced? You decide. Um, I won't belabor that. Okay, so a two to the fourth factorial experiment yields 16 experimental conditions. A two to the fifth produces 32. 
Um, this should not, and we write this in grant proposals, should not be considered a 16 arm RCT. Okay, so a two to the fourth factorial experiment, we refer to one through 16 as experimental conditions rather than arms. All right, at the end of that experiment, the end of the optimization trial, you want to, and you will be able to estimate the effect of each component on the outcome. So you'll produce a main effect for each one of those factors and then um, interactions all the way up to, you know, K factors that you have. So a two to the fifth factorial experiment where I have five factors, I would have all the way up to a five-way interaction that I'm able to estimate. Um, at the end of the optimization trial, we are also able to identify what, which components and at what level best meet our optimization objective. So remember what I said, we could design the coolest intervention in the world, but if it's not, doesn't fit within the time, the money or other constraints, no one's going to use it, right? Um, and so that's what we're able to do with these data. And then all of that information comes into um, the identification of the optimized intervention. So at this point, if we decide that our optimized intervention is likely to be effective, we would move forward into the evaluation phase where we would compare that optimized intervention to a suitable control, maybe using a randomized control trial design, maybe not. You, it doesn't have to be the RCT. Um, I will just pause to say more often than not, funders really look for the RCT, right? But it might not be the most effective or resource responsible experimental design. So this brings into account a principle you see at the bottom of the figure here called the resource management principle, which is engineering derived from engineering. And this says we're going to choose the design that makes best use of available resources to answer the question. So there's that. Um, the next thing I want to point out is at the top of the figure, the continual optimization principle. So this says that even an optimized intervention can be further optimized. And for some, that's like this really daunting realization that like, oh my goodness, your work is never done. But this makes total sense, right? Because there's new science, there's new constraints, there's new players at the table, and we need to make sure that the intervention fits within that context. So we call this the continual optimization principle that we would keep returning to make the intervention more and more um, you know, balanced between effectiveness and those other qualities. So, right, that was very, you know, theoretical in the sky kind of thing. Here, I'm going to show you a, the results of a optimization trial. Um, it's hypothetical. I, I'm not a smoking cessation expert. Just please go with me. Um, this is an example where we've identified four components for smoking cessation. Those four components are a pre-quit nicotine patch, pre-quit counseling, in-person counseling and telephone counseling. So four factors, two levels each, 16 experimental conditions. And so these 16 conditions reflect all possible combinations of those four factors, right? You saw this. So this is our the experimental design. Now we run the optimization trial and these, we get our results. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except to say that this equation should look fairly familiar to you. You analyze data from a, a factorial experiment using a factorial ANOVA. So it's not rocket science. <laughs> um, it, it is, you know, a, a generalized linear model. So anyway, the results, I'm ignoring interactions for sake of simplicity here, but we take our equation, we plug in our results, and we produce the best expected outcome for each one of our combinations. So now you see at the last column is my predicted days smoke free. And this is telling me that for combination number one, I get four days. 
for experimental combination, let's see, six, I get 16 days. So the best um, expected outcome is here in experimental condition 16, where all four factors are turned on and I get 26 days smoke-free, okay? But now let's suppose that we have a constraint. The insurance company says you can only pay $500 per patient. So we need to find what, you know, what experimental condition produces the best expected number of days smoke-free for no more than $500 per person. And so you're able, you plug in the implementation cost for each one of those components, kind of same into that same equation, essentially, to produce the amount of money for each one of the combinations. So I've got predicted day smoke-free, and now I've added the expected cost next to it. So anything highlighted in red is out, right? Because it's over $500. You'll notice, right, experimental condition 16 that gave us 26 days smoke-free, well, it's $700. We can't use it. Isn't that good to know? I'm, this is like where the magic really happens for me and I get excited. Um, so those eight, 15, and 16, they're out. So for $500, you see that in experimental condition seven, I can get 18 days smoke-free. Great. But look here. In experimental condition 14, I can get 20 days smoke-free for $475. So this gives you a way to kind of balance money and resources with the outcome. All right. I'm assuming all of you that I can't see are like, wow, this is amazing. Okay, good. Glad we're on the same page. <laughs> So, all right, that was my hypothetical example showing you the power of what optimization can do. And now I want to tell you how I think intervention optimization and implementation science can be integrated um, to move prevention forward. So this, this, I have three ways that I think this could happen. Um, the first one is what we've been through. Um, we can optimize interventions for immediate scalability, which means we're taking into, the, into account those implementation constraints as we develop the intervention. Okay, so this is what we've just been through. I'm not gonna go through it again. Now, second thing I think we can do with optimization and implementation science is use the data from an optimization trial to inform local adaptations. Um, or, you know, local contexts. So suppose we do an optimization trial and we have five components. We can take those data and apply them to different settings. So suppose setting one, we know that they can only spend $300 per person. Using the results of our optimization trial where we've tested all five components, we know for $300, the best outcome is produced by the combination of components one, two, and four. So the optimized intervention for setting A has one, two, and four. Now we go to a different setting where we only have $200. Here, those same results are gonna tell us that the best expected outcome is produced by components one, three, and five. So the optimized intervention is different for the two settings, but they're both producing the best expected outcome. We're taking data from one trial to inform two different settings. Super cool. Okay. Third thing that can happen is impl optimizing implementation. So let's say that you have developed or you work with a group of people or you work in a field that says our intervention is okay. We don't wanna mess around with the effectiveness of the intervention, but the implementation could be improved. So we're calling this a sealed intervention. I'm not changing the intervention that is delivered to a person, but what I'm gonna do is uh, 
like a, what we could say a wrap around intervention. So we're going to play with the implementation of it. So for example, let's say that we have a intervention um, delivered through an app. Maybe it's a walking, you know, physical activity kind of intervention. And it's effective when engagement is really high. But we all know that we stop using our fun apps after a certain period of time, right? And so we could use most to develop a intervention that increases engagement of that app. Okay, so that's the implementation, We're optimizing the implementation of the intervention. Um, and I'm just gonna say that this is a open area of interest. So I've laid out three ways that intervention science and or intervention optimization and implementation science could benefit each other, but this, this is not the end of it. And so I'm calling attention to a special collection that we have open in the Implementation Research and Practice Journal. There's no deadline. Um, we are accepting papers now until, you know, Kara Lewis tells me to stop. Um, but this is a place where you could share other ideas or showcase other methods, um, ideas that you have around intervention optimization and implementation science. Okay, I achieved my goal of leaving a lot of time for questions, which was my intention. I'm going to leave this up here for just a bit. Um, so if you have questions, if you have a project that you are interested in maybe thinking about how to use most, um, please email me. That's This is part of my job, which is the best part. Um, and we are, are you know, positioned at CADIO to help support particularly people in the New York City area, but also nationwide um, who want to use most. Thank you so much. That was so <laughs> amazing. I feel like I had so many misconceptions of what <laughs> most an optimization was. So thank yeah. you for really taking us through that step-by-step -step and all these resources.